To really uh, understand toy program, everybody's encouraged to study the book and try some of the exercises and read the programs there. We have several uh, toy programs that uh, you can easily learn from. And today we'll give a couple more examples of toy programming, but really today's lecture is about putting toy in context, both in historical context and to consider some of the implications of having a machine that operates with such simple rules. Let's start by putting toy a little bit in perspective. So uh, let's consider toy versus your laptop. Uh, they're different, totally different computing machines, while well, one's imaginary. But they both implement basic data types, conditionals, loops, and other low-level constructs. You can have arrays, functions, library, and other high-level constructs, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. And both have infinite input and output streams. So really, uh, what you can see eventually, if you look at this issue enough, is that all the basic building blocks that we studied when you first did Java programming, it's possible to implement all, all of them uh, in TOY. Now, you might say, well, but TOY's only got 256 words. Is that really enough to do anything useful? Uh, and it absolutely is. We'll talk about that uh, in just a second. Uh, of course, we definitely want a faster version with more memory when we can afford it. But the point is that uh, everything that we've done with Java uh, really is possible to do with Toy. It's just a matter of scale. So let's talk about this issue, about 256 16-bit words. That would be 4,096 bits of memory. Is that really enough to do anything useful? Uh, so, you know, here's an example from uh, an old computer from the 1960s, 50-year-old computer. Uh, in, the, in those days, uh, every bit was a physical piece of metal. It had three wires running through it. Uh, so, a thousand bits was something that was uh, difficult and expensive to produce. But this is an actual 1,000-bit uh, memory. If you had four of those, you'd have 4,000 bits of memory. Is that enough to do anything useful? Well, actually it is because this thing is the memory from the Apollo guidance computer uh, that got men to the moon and back. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this is an experimental computer at MIT. It's got more bits. It's got 24,000 bits. And this was earlier. This was uh, in the late 1950s. Uh, and people were using computers like this, like toy, to do biomedical experiments and all sorts of other uh, experimentation. Uh, this is a gentleman named Wes Clark in the early 1960s, and I put his picture up because uh, his son, Doug Clark, uh, is my colleague uh, and has taught this course many times. So uh, let's look at this even in more detail. So 4,000 bits of memory. So actually, if you consider the contents of the memory registers in PC at a particular time, uh, we talked about this at the beginning. It provides a complete record of what a program has done, and it also completely determines what the machine will do next. Toy is a deterministic machine based on uh, just these bits of memory. And if we count up the total number of bits uh, involved, well, actually, since we use the last location for standard input, there's 255 times 16 bits for memory. Since register zero is always zero, there's 15 times 16 bits for the register. Uh, and then there's the PC. So there's a grand total of 4,328 bits. But those bits can be either zero or one. So the total number of different states that the machine could be in is two to the 4,328th power. Or that's more than 10 to the 1,300th power. That is an enormous number, and the machine could be in any one of those states, and that state would determine some new state uh, completely uh, and uniquely determined. Uh, that's a, such a huge number, uh, and we talk about this in the theory lecture as well. Uh, if you took every electron in the universe and put a supercomputer examining states for all its entire lifetime, uh, you only get to about 10 to the 109th states. Uh, that 10 to the 1300 is uh, a stupefyingly large number. It means you need 10 to the 1200 universes, every electron in all those universes running supercomputers. Uh, and these are our basic estimates. You can argue with them, but it doesn't uh, affect the main point. And the bottom line is we'll never know what a machine with 4,096 bits of memory can do. 
Uh, there's so, so, so many more states uh, than uh, we'll ever see uh, in uh, the lifetime of the universe. So, uh, yes, uh, 4,096 bits of main memory is certainly enough to do something useful. Uh, now let's talk a little bit uh, about some historical context. Uh, so a very early computer was called the ENIAC, was uh, being uh, developed by uh, Mockley and Eckert. Uh, it's uh, often uh, given the distinction of being the first widely known general purpose electronic computer. Uh, there's a lot of debate about this and you can read about other candidates as well. It had conditional jumps, uh, it was programmable, but uh, it didn't have memory. Uh, programming was a matter of changing switches and t cable connections. So at the back of the machine were cables and you replugged the machine uh, to get it to ready to perform a certain uh, calculation. And then the machine would crunch data and do things like uh, plot a parabola to figure out where a missile would go or something of the sort. Uh, the data came in on punch cards. So there'd be a lot of numbers on punch cards and the machine would uh, read those numbers and compute with them. That's uh, how the ENIAC worked. And, and that was uh, a 30 ton machine that filled a room. Uh, it had vacuum tubes. It could do 300 multiplies in a second. And a bit was a physical thing uh, called a vacuum tube. Uh, so there were uh, a lot of obstacles to overcome in using a machine like this to solve scientific problems. Uh, but definitely uh, it, was, it was running and, and working and, uh, and helpful in preparing ballistics tables uh, for use during the war. Uh, now, uh, there's a famous uh, memo that I want to talk about uh, called First Draft of a Report on the EDVAC that was written by John von Neumann, a mathematician at Princeton. Uh, the EDVAC was the next computer that was proposed to be built by Eckert and Mockley, and von Neumann worked with them uh, over the summer uh, in 1945. Uh, but he also was working at Los Alamos on uh, mathematical calculations and simulations for the atom bomb. And he had to take a train to Los Alamos to write up a report on their work on the EDVAC. It turned out that that memo was a brilliant summation of the concept of having a memory and storing a program in the memory, and really a complete design of a computer that could do it. Now, von Neumann had heard about the theories of Alan Turing and the idea of a program that could operate on another program as data definitely influenced his thinking on this, and it's influenced the design of every computer since. Uh, reading this memo, uh, particularly after you've done with the next few lectures where we talk about uh, designing and building such a machine, uh, it's quite striking how much is in, in this memo uh, that we use uh, regularly today uh, and every computer does. Uh, and so the question of who invented the stored program computer, there's really a fascinating controversy about that. Uh, so Eckert and Mockley had discussed the idea before von Neumann arrived on the scene and discussed it with von Neumann uh, in their uh, joint work uh, when talking about the design of the EDVAC. Uh, but von Neumann wrote everything up and he was on a long train ride and he had uh, every uh, part of what he knew at his command, uh, including the amazing theories of Alan Turing. He was in a unique position to put it all together, and that's precisely what he did. Uh, now, uh, when uh, von Neumann arrived in uh, Los Alamos, a young Lieutenant Herman Goldstein circulated the draft because he could see uh, what an amazing document it was, and there was a lot of interest. Uh, but the public disclosure of that draft of the first of uh, the report on the EDVAC uh, meant that, that uh, Eckert and Malkley could not patent their design. Uh, and of course, they were not uh, very happy about that. Uh, von Neumann never specifically took credit for the idea of stored program computing, but he actually never gave credit to others uh, either. Uh, so we're all going to have to make up our minds on this. Uh, another example, just as an indication of the impact of von Neumann's menu, memo, just uh, uh, not very long after the memo was published, uh, Maurice Wilkes in England built uh, another machine called the Ed Sac, uh, and that one had uh, lots of characteristics very uh, similar to the machines we use today. 
The data instructions were loaded in binary. You could load programs, not just data, into the memory, and you could change the program without rewiring. And those are all characteristics that we depend on, and we'll come back to this uh, later in this lecture. Uh, that machine had uh, 512 17-bit words, uh, not so different than toy, uh, two registers, 16 instructions, the input was paper tape, uh, the output was not paper tape, uh, it was a teleprinter, uh, and there uh, a bit was a different kind of device, uh, not a vacuum tube, but still uh, not that much smaller. Uh, and this thing came into existence quite quickly uh, because von Neumann's memo so beautifully laid out the blueprint of what needed to be done. So, uh, and in fact, the architecture, the basic architecture of the stored program computer has been the basis of nearly all computers since the 50s. Uh, so uh, all the things that we use, your phone, uh, server farm, uh, PC, uh, and toy and the old computers, all had this, basically the same design that we're going to be looking at in the next couple of lectures. Uh, the practical implica implications of a stored program computer is that we can download apps. When you download an application into your phone, you're loading a program into the memory of your phone. Seems so uh, straightforward and natural today, but remember the, uh, the first computer didn't have that capability. Uh, the other thing is we can write programs that make programs as output. That's what compilers and interpreters are and many, many other uh, types of programs that we'll talk about. Uh, and you can also write programs that take programs as input and you can simulate other machines. That was Turing's uh, brilliant concept. Uh, so these implications are very profound as we discuss in a lot more detail in the, in the theory lectures. With TOY, you can solve any problem that any other computer can solve, but you also have the limitation that some problems can't be solved by any computer at all. All of this is by way of uh, justifying studying TOY carefully. It's a simple machine that has the same characteristics of all the machines uh, that we use. The only difference is a matter of scale. And that's what we're going to go into next is to uh, look at some of these implications in more detail.